Well, welcome back to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Mandy Connor. So Mandy, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm correctly, um, currently the Director of Teaching and Learning at the Catholic Education in Western Australia. Um, we, we've got 162 Catholic schools in Western Australia, and they're spread throughout a very vast state. Um, I, I'm new to this role. I commenced the role at the beginning of this year. And prior to that, I was the principal of, a, of K-12 colleges for 20 years. Um, I was the foundation principal at my last school, which was called Holy Cross College. And I had a wonderful opportunity to really think about learning and to engage with contemporary pedagogies um, using digital tools. Uh, when I took on this role, um, I did take on the responsibility for overseeing vision. So vision is one of the programs we have in Catholic schools, Western Australia. It's quite a, um, a new program for us. It's been running for a couple of years, um, but it's really about uh, providing a diverse curriculum, particularly for those students who live perhaps in rural or remote areas, um, or also those who, live, who um, perhaps are in smaller schools so that they can access some of their um, upper school studies, their year 11, 12 studies online. Um, but it was five to six weeks into this new role when it really became clear that we needed to prepare for the possibility of remote learning. Um, and that for the most schools, this is going to be in the form of some sort of online learning. So I worked with a team of educators um, to put together a planning document to support schools in developing their own education response plan to enable them to continue to deliver high quality Catholic education in the event of what was now clearly going to be an unprecedented educational disruption. Um, so for me, I think for all of our leaders in the system, um, there was lots and lots of new learning. But it was pretty clear that the time frame was going to be short and that schools needed to work from where they were in their own context and within a framework of system support um, if they were going to be able to continue to deliver educational outcomes with the disruptions that were clearly lying ahead. Um, as a system, we've got quite a strong system IT infrastructure and that certainly served us well. Um, but we've also had to take into account the different skill level, um, different levels of confidence of both staff and students, um, access to devices, access to internet, and also the age of students as well. Um, I'm a strong advocate that it always must be the learning and that is the driver and that the tool is what supports that learning. And that is something that's been really um, central to me, my role as a principal um, leading in this space, um, that it must, we must keep learning very much at the centre, um, not be focusing on the tool. So that's really been central um, to what I think has been our leadership in terms of this space is to help people to transition into the online learning space in a critical time, um, to make sure that we're building technical skill, that technical support is available. But the focus of my team has been to keep the site firmly on the learning. We've provided um, professional learning and we've provided resources. But the most important thing I think we've done is to try to build strong online networks of teachers sharing with each other through virtual meetings and through virtual forums. So really trying to share um, the expertise and the learning that is out there in the schools. Um, and we've also emphasised the importance of strong relationships and the emphasis on quality rather than quantity. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting time for me because I came in with, a, um, I guess, a strong background in working in the, um, the digital space and with very much that focus on learning. Um, but it was in face-to-face -face schools um, with children from sort of three-year-olds right through to 18-year-olds. So this has been a great learning experience for me and really to have a look at how have we shifted our practice and how is that going to shape um, what we do as we go forward um, as a system. Okay. So now you've been a school leader yourself, and this is probably unlike any sort of, you know, school year that you've seen previous to this in terms of the disruption that we've had um, in the last few weeks. What advice would you have for school leaders out there in terms of things that they could be doing to make the transition back to whatever the new normal is going to look like? a little easier for students and teachers out there? Yes, well, that's a really timely question for us. Um, we've just started the second of the four terms that we have in our school year. And so leaders, um, I think, really need to take the long view now to ensure that they can sustain the learning in whatever context lies ahead in this new normal. 
Um, you know, unlike the Northern Hemisphere schools, where in a sense you're moving towards the long break, uh, we've got the whole year of learning in terms of this academic year. So we need to be able to see that um, through this um, really unprecedented time that we can actually sustain that learning. Um, for us, the students are starting to return to classrooms. So most of our upper school students are returned two weeks ago. And um, we have a mixture of students both at home and at school in terms of the students from the primary years and the lower secondary years. Um, but it's fair to say that unless significant um, changes happen in the next couple of weeks, we will see increasing number of students returning to that face-to-face -face learning. Um, but I think we also need to be very cognizant that, you know, certainly over the next few months, perhaps even a lot more than that, um, we will have some students who will need um, to learn at home and perhaps some staff who even need to deliver at home for one reason or another. Um, so I think as students return to the classrooms, one of the first things we need to do is to really celebrate um, the incredible response of their school communities in moving to online learning. Um, you know, I think I've just been inspired by what people have done in their schools in such a short space of time. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about it and reflecting on it, I think, you know, we have to remind people that we didn't plan to do this for a year or two years or three years. We actually moved into it very, very quickly. And we need to celebrate the way in which we did that. Um, I think we also need to listen to the voice of staff and students and parents um, about the challenges but also about what they learned from the experience. We need to think about what this means for learning as we go forward. And I think we need to provide opportunities for teachers and for leaders to reflect on their practice and on their ability to be agile during this time. I think it's really interesting that it's been a great opportunity for leaders to learn more about their staff and really to get to know their staff and perhaps to really reflect now on um, now that we've really perhaps got a stronger sense of our staff's collective e efficacy, then what does this mean for us as we move forward? Um, as a system, our education response plan had three phases. So broadly, it was prepare, respond, recover. And I think as we now move into the recovery phase, um, our leaders need to consider with their school communities, how well did their response plan work? What did it look like at each phase? What went well? What didn't go so well? What does a recovery period look like? Um, what did they learn if this was to happen again? And being very aware of the possibility of a second wave of COVID infections. Now, you mentioned a, a second wave of, of COVID infections. Um, you know, based upon the, the medical experts out there, that seems to be a, a likely occurrence. And, um, depending upon how viral it is at the time and how widespread and exactly when it happens, we could find ourselves, you know, shut down again, or at least certain parts of the system shut down again. Uh, beyond sort of the, the short term of looking at the, how to overcome the current disruption, thinking about the, the long game, what can school leaders do to make the transition next time a little more seamless than the sort of abrupt fashion that we had uh, this time, regardless of how well we, we did that in a short period of time. Um, it was still sort of a, you know, we've got to get this done, we've got to get it done now. Um, hopefully the next time folks would be in a position where we can just sort of, not necessarily just flip a switch, but at least we know what we need to do. How can school leaders get us to that point? Mm. Look, I, I think that's really important because, you know, as you say, it just happened so quickly. And look, I think one of the things that we're really glad that we did was as things escalated on the world um, stage, uh, we realised that we needed to make plans as a system. And I've mentioned that we, um, we did develop that uh, framework for schools to develop their own response plans. So we do have now a, um, a plan that was developed in um, conjunction with school leaders. And it's really um, served as well as a framework for people to move through these phases. So, um, you, know, you know, we really need to reflect on that. Um, as we move forward, as you say, in case we do need to activate this again. But I also think that, um, you know, it is in different ways too, because we may just have a set four um, large numbers of staff or even small numbers but of staff or students um, who need to be at home and students who will need to learn from home. 
So look, we're fortunate in Australia um, in that we are, as they say, flattening the curve and that many students are returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Um, but we don't know what lies ahead and we need to be prepared for further disruption, um, including, but hopefully not, a second wave. Um, so, so my advice to school leaders is really to think about and talk to each other about what have they learned in the first wave? And most importantly, talk to the students. Um, you know, really listen to their voices in terms of, uh, you know, what was hard, but also, you know, what did they miss and what did they even have value in that experience as well? Um, I've never heard a number of people talking about that sometimes students who perhaps didn't speak up in the classroom actually were speaking up in the online space. So how do we retain some of those things um, that were really valuable for some students as we move back into um, the face-to-face -face teaching? I've been really inspired by the agility um, with which school systems did move to remote learning in that short space of time. And I think as we um, scramble to prepare, um, it really was, um, you know, there was a great I can do this attitude. And many teachers um, are much more confident now in using technology and they're better able to focus on the pedagogy in the online space. So, you know, even teachers who were adept at using technology were challenged by the move to full online learning because, as you know, it's your area of expertise. Um, using digital tools well in a face-to-face -face context is quite different to using digital tools um, in the, an online experience. So I think leaders and teachers need to continue to engage with these challenges, um, thinking about lesson design, about feedback, about online collaboration, um, thinking about the facts that when we talk about online learning, it doesn't mean that students are in front of screens all of the time. So I guess it's somewhere in that blended world that we could learn some, you know, really long-term lessons that would benefit us both in the current time um, in the face-to-face -face teaching, um, but also in the future if we had to move back fully into um, that online world. Um, my advice is don't just go back to the old ways. Think about the skills which stood the students in good stead during this time. Um, skills such as the capacity to work independently, to think critically. Now more than ever, we need to think about how do we develop these skills? In a very short space of time, education changed in unprecedented ways. Um, and as a result, we had to change the mind, our mind frame from this idea that learning takes place mostly in school, or even perhaps sometimes we think, you know, apart from homework, it takes place all in school, um, to an idea that learning's always taken place outside the school. That in fact, you know, we need to work and do work in partnership with parents to ignite learning in places other than the classroom. So, you know, how do we ignite that context in a real world setting? We've talked about that a lot in the last few years. You know, we talk about authentic learning, we've talked about real world learning. Um, but something that's really excited me is watching how teachers have used the environment of children's in the home to ignite their learning. So, you know, to actually look at them using um, the materials in the home, the context in the home, the context in the world, to actually make that learning um, very, very authentic. Um, you know, from things um, such as actually engaging with the current crisis, using that data in terms of perhaps some of our maths lessons, um, to going out into the garden and using, um, you know, the plants and all of those things out there as part of our learning as well. So, you know, I think what we've done is we've got teachers who have done this. They've actually ignited their con um, content using a real-world context, and that context has been um, very much the student's environment and those different environments during this time. So I guess the question is how do we hold on to some of that as we move forward? You know, how do we ensure that we harness that learning into the future? Because my belief is that if we do this, if we continue to build those skills that really um, stood the students in good stead during this time, um, you know, sometimes we talk about those as the soft skills, but if we make sure we're really cognizant about developing those, um, you know, if we continue to be cognizant of that authentic learning of using that real life context, then I think that's going to prepare us um, not only for potential future disruption, which might be a result of both the current pandemic or perhaps the future pandemic, but I think that more than that, 
it will really empower us to develop authentic lifelong learning. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mandy. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with has been Mandy Connor.